Mr. Mike Sharman, I was tempted to introduce you as the other Mike in uh, <laughs> marketing, but I like I fear that that might not be the case. I think I'm the other Mike. Like I'm the 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 other dude in social media um, these days. But d- thanks so much for taking time um, out of your diary. I know you're extremely busy at the moment. Most of our listeners will know you from uh, Retroviral, this uh, amazing agency that you've built up over the last decade or more. Um, and there's been two businesses that have kind of sparked out of the existence of Retroviral and are doing some really interesting uh, new work. And I'd love to talk to you about those. First of all, how the ideas came about for them and yeah, what, what what's the latest in terms of what you're keeping busy with? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are multiple Mike S's in this crazy world of ours. So I think uh, that's always uh, always pretty entertaining, uh, whether Indeed. it be it in Western Cape or ever. Um, it's entertaining for us, if for nobody yeah, else. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's a personal joke. Um, <laughs> so I think what, what has been interesting is obviously um, Retroviral was kind of born after having spent two years in the UK. The reason mm-hmm. why I got to the UK was by winning a super fan competition with Castle. So I yeah. got to go and you know, watch the Proteas draw at Lords and then end up winning a series in 2008 and then went and watched multiple rugby matches at um, the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, which was uh, yeah. one of those absolute bucket lists, as well as a trip to to Croke Park to watch Ireland and, and the Springboks Amazing. play. And I think that, um, you know, off the back of that, uh, returning to South Africa to launch Retroviral in 2010, there were a lot of projects that we got pulled into, and I think you can definitely relate to this from all of the stuff you've been involved in. But one of the aspects of sport, which always fascinated me, was how so few agencies really have an obsessive sports people in their midst. And mm. I think that mm. the real fanboys and fanaticism is kind of few and far between. And I think that's kind of what led to the landscape of sports agency explosion and the creation of sports specialists and uh, what was really interesting back in 2011 um, my friend Ben and I we uh, basically were contracted by MasterCard to go and witness history which was the the tagline for the World Cup and the MasterCard Association Bob Skinstat was the the ambassador at the time Mm -hmm, so Ben mm -hmm. and I because it is 2011 we didn't have a very structured brief so we were flown to Auckland, we got to wear the fancy Qantas pajamas, you know, we, we, Amazing. We that full on experience. And unfortunately, the box had been knocked out of the, the World Cup, but we got to watch a third and fourth uh, place playoff. And then we, we got to witness history as the All Blacks uh, regained the William Webb Ellis trophy in their backyard. And um, yeah. it is a matter of just creating content on the fly, going to fan parks, meeting and interviewing interesting fans from around the world. Uh, sneaking into commentary boxes to speak to some of the the world's greatest players to ask them about their perspective. And we effectively built this narrative around the history and the association of of rugby and what it meant to both New Zealanders and to a global audience. And Ben and I, we just always spoke about creating something that was dedicated to sport. And Mm. uh, Ben at the time, he was working at an agency who represented BMW, BMW was a bad sponsor on the box uh, shorts. So he was also in his agency, he was an anomaly in terms of uh, the stuff that he was creating and the work that he was involved in. And fast forward a few years, he went on and he worked with Gareth Cliff. He created the, the sports content for Cliff Central and, and Ben became one of the foremost kind of fan voices on social media in South Africa as Follow the Bounce. It's and, fair to uh, say, Mike, sorry to interrupt you, but I think there were there are many agencies in the ecosystem that were that were helping clients with the massive investments they'd made in sporting products, but exclusively through the channel of kind of media management, planning and optimization, not really around content or fan engagement. Is it fair to say that you saw the big gap in in, in that opportunity and especially in, in the digital realm? I think what, what's interesting is, is just how so many brands, they don't necessarily have a strategic kind of intent when it comes to sport generally there's someone in the c-suite or who controls the purse strings and they would say like i like golf, yeah. I like golf. <laughs> yeah. let's respond to the masters or yeah. they would they would be pitched by a dst media sales or, or, or a media company and say we have this package on x y and z sport you should get involved and i think that that's still a uh, to a large degree, the the reality. I think there, there are a few brands that have used sport from a strategic perspective. Um, and then back in 2017, 
Um, Brian Habana was coming to the end of his career and he and I were at school together and we just started having some conversations around sport. And, you know, there's this whole kind of layer to the Brian Habana onion that so few people had ever been exposed to just from his mm. tech and his business prowess. And um, he'd been involved in a thesis when he was playing in France as, you know, part of his uh, rugby career, the, the the French contracts are very geared towards your life outside of sport. Hmm. So he was invested in to go to business school and be able to follow a passion and something that he was interested in. And he'd actually been working on a on a thesis to help rugby players once they retire, you know, go from these absolute, the pantheons of, of heroship to absolute zeros. And so many of his contemporaries being sucked into mental health issues and not being able yeah, to know yeah. how to deal with that. And um, I think there was a lot of like serendipity. It's, I think that's an important word where a lot of the, the direction of my career and my life has gone is like just having those networks, having those connections and just picking up the phone or Skype and having a conversation around like what's next. And um, at first we actually started thinking around a tech player and a tech product mm. uh, that would analyze sports. So either a bolt on to a brand's eye or some other ORM uh, online reputation management software where we mm. could analyze an ecosystem and then you as a brand you might want to compare yourself as a bank to what the other banks are doing and yeah, then that's quite okay. easy wines yeah. to wales versus cape epic what returns is it delivering what kind of um, share of voice am i getting is my spend uh, kind of equal correlated to that yeah exactly yeah and, and that was kind of the the thoughts around this this product that we wanted to to have a go at and uh, after having a few conversations um for me i'm not i'm not much of a business plan person but just having a few conversations with sports agencies with brands that invest in sports and just trying to ascertain like would they use a tool like this would the intelligence help them or is this something that they, they rely on a third party to provide mm -hmm. anyway it made me realize that it was probably a lot more research time and potential actual hard cash investment that needed to go into this. And for me, I like to create businesses that you can start generating revenue from day one. You don't necessarily need to have a long tail effect. And I just mm -hmm. felt like there was too much cash output with not necessarily the return on investment that would go into that. And um, the decision was was made, like, why don't we create a sister agency to Retroviral? And that was the genesis of Retroactive. And yeah. we were fortunate enough to pick up a piece of business from Biogen. They were on a mission to be more authentic. The, they had some PR issues with a fighter who had tested positive and blamed them um, for having said substance in their product. They had scientists and doctors who proved that that couldn't have been the case. Um, but in, still, like as a brand who didn't really spend a lot of money on earned media, they were almost on the back foot in terms of mm. the court mm. of public opinion. Um, so I went to the office in, in the Discam offices in Midrand. I saw this message emblazoned on the back wall and it said, um, we want to be the most authentic health and wellness brand in the country. And mm. I said, why don't we make one of my best mates your guinea pig? He can be the perfect foil of South Africa's health issues. So we took my mate Hobbo. Uh, he was 130 kilograms. He was under six foot, worst shape of his life. I didn't tell him, but I pitched him as a 33-year-old white male who had the discovery vitality age of a 55-year-old plus. So that definitely was the key insight that uh, that closed the deal. And then what we did was we documented the strong, yeah. We paired him with the bio. We paired him with uh, Coach Parry, who's a comrades coach and Olympic mm, coach. Mm. And uh, he started basically with very much his, his crawl to walk. He started walking. He was able to swim. He was a, an okay cyclist, but we basically got him from ticking off very small milestones until he completed the Durban Half Ironman in Durban. And we used Stunning, Facebook yeah. as the vehicle to distribute the story. So every fortnight, uh, Ben would upload a new video about Hobbo and his progress. And he managed to complete that, that event with 15 minutes to go. And, and for the mm -hmm. listeners or, or viewers who don't know what a Half Ironman is, I mean, that's a 1.9 kilometer swim a 90 kilometer cycle and a 21 kilometer run in, in succession. And yeah. uh, it was the most incredible story because he wasn't an influencer. We called him our influencer. He was the anti-hero. People would bump into him at the Westcliff stairs or at the cradle for warm up 
triathlons and they'd be like, oh, Hubba, we're following your journey. And the great thing was that anybody could share their progress on anything that they were seeking to achieve. So some people were literally from couch to park run. Some people mm -hmm. wanting to complete a personal best of comrades. Others were wanting to do a triathlon like Hobo. And it really allowed just a random fat white guy to appeal to a broad audience of men, women, black, white, and uh, generate interest from a PR perspective from news channels and p newspapers and, and radio shows and a whole bunch of, of different main media uh, channels, which was, uh, which was incredible. It also had an actual impact on the business. It, it helped drive Biogen sales. The salespeople in store got excited about him. They were sharing the enthusiasm. So it almost created a foil for m multiple excitement and touch points. Yeah, Mike, I mean, this has always been your superpower and, and something I'm not afraid to admit I've been quite jealous of is your ability to see magic in the midst of what could look quite ordinary to other people. And you've done this time and time and again where you've spotted for brands an opportunity to shine on, on often a shoestring budget or with very few resources in crazy time frames. I mean, the classic example from your recent uh, work would be like my creepy teacher, which a lot of people would see and know and have laughed at many times without even knowing that it came out of your your stable. But it, your ability to see an opportunity, create value, and get it into in, in, you know in, into some version of reality is is unmatched. Speaking of which, <laughs> it, it, I want to hear about how the idea for Match Kit came about because what's interesting about Match Kit is this is quite a different business, a, a substantially different business. Um, and I know from my own experience that I've had multiple ambitions and ideas for creating a technology product oriented enterprise, but I kind of always get stuck in selling hours, uh, you know, from an agency or consulting perspective. Talk to me about where the idea for match kit came from, how, how that sort of was born out of your experiences in retroactive. And, and you've also, I mean, you've had some amazing news there recently by being included on the alpha code uh, incubation journey. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what match kit is and how that came about. So what's been interesting is with the retroactive journey, not just Hobo the amateur, but we've actually been fortunate enough to work with several athletes and a lot mm. of them in a niche play. And for so many of those niche athletes, they rely on a sponsor or some sort of third party to help fund and commercialize their journey. And I think mm. that's the that's the greatest challenge for so many athletes is that they are incredible on the pitch, on the field, in the pool, whatever it is that um, makes them tick competitively but when it comes to wearing that marketing or branding hat that's generally where they fall short and if you think about it most athletes who kind of fit into the journey men and women category they're mm. never going to scale the heights where they are going to attract an agent or people that want to commit time to them for the potential upside that that brings and yeah, i think tiger woods money yeah exactly the same thing with with niche with niche sports it's it's not exactly going to get you out of bed as an agent to try and help someone make a few thousand rand every month to put some food on the table. Yeah. And um, I think there were, there were almost like three key moments that happened uh, around a similar period. I read That'll Never Work by Mark Randolph, who's the co-founder of Netflix. Like there's there's basically two big Netflix books at the moment. There's, there's Mark Randolph's and he's the lesser known co-founder. And then there's obviously Reed and his journey. And Reed's obviously the, the most famous the culture of, one, yeah. of the co-founders. And um, Mark Randolph really just documents the story from them wanting to sell customized surfboards to then going into a space of wanting to deliver actual VHSs to people. And then fortunately, because the Japanese invented DVD, here was a technology that they were able to go and have an entire catalog of all the DVDs that were ever created. And the journey of that from product to digital product and ultimately streaming service product, like that for me was like a really interesting evolution. And um, the second thing was Brian got invited to have a dinner with uh, Vinny Lingham when he was in town. And he mm. and, and Brian had met at the San Diego Sevens back in the back in the day when there were still events and uh, and global <laughs> rugby tournaments. And the one thing that Vinny brought up was like in that conversation, he said, you know, why don't we look at at creating a product with Brian on it? Like, is it an energy drink? Is it an is it a, 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 a goo product? Is it yeah. a, an energy bar? And um Brian's a very interesting individual in terms of the protection that he offers his personal brand. He's he's very well versed in terms of what will be a success for his personal brand and where should he not venture. And I think 
uh, that was an interesting space of debate around, is it a product? Is it an actual energy drink? What is it? And then the third thing was, um, I had the opportunity to spend my last international trip before the world turned upside down, going to Anfield to watch Liverpool's last home match uh, mm. of the, mm. the Premier League winning season. And um, after we returned from that, I mean, the whole world pretty much shut down. And with those three things combined, coupled with Brian having been at the World Cup final and his insight that not even Sia had a website, some pimply-faced teenager in the US was domain squatting on siakhaleesi.com. It, it kind of gave me more insights into the fact that Brian is an anomaly. Like if we look at Brian as the way that he's built a personal brand, whenever there's been a new social channel, he may not have been an expert at it, but he would register the mm -hmm. Brian Havana handle as almost like a backup. Like if Pinterest was the thing to explode, if TikTok, et cetera, like he was always very much of an early adopter in, in yeah. gaining access to Brian Havana, the property. And off the back of that... It's just an awareness of the value of his name and staking that claim, right? Um, exactly. And, yeah. and I think what's, what's fascinating about the lack of website adoption is that why do most athletes not have a website? One, there's dev required. You need devs involved. You need designers. And social came along and it gave you a platform where you could run your own personal brand. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, social is just that. It's social. It's not commercial. And too few agents realize the benefit of having a domain or having a space that you can own on the internet as your ecosystem that you own and isn't owned by one of the tech conglomerates. And yeah, I, I suppose another dynamic there, Mike, sorry, but it's worth pointing out because I think it's true for a lot of companies as well is that the neglect of one's owned platforms has translated to sort of um, individuals and businesses building like these massive properties in terms of value and audience numbers and content or whatever it might be, but on platforms that where they're kind of at the behest of whatever changes uh, Facebook or Twitter or whoever it is deem are important to their business model <laughs> at any given point in time. And that, I mean, sometimes that works in their favor, but you know, ultimately it's not, you, you're building a mansion on land you, you don't own. Um, and course, that's, I mean, yeah, it's a scary it's prospect. A totally, it's a totally extreme example, but think about being business Trump. Like if you'd built your entire business that relied on the spread and the virality and the shareability of that platform, the next day that is turned off and suddenly that's had a huge impact on your business and, and in terms of your, your messaging and, and all those uh, potential reach aspects. So I think ultimately... Um, when all of these things combined and collided and the world turned upside down, the initial thought was, okay, let's build a, a personal branding web builder product for athletes because we've seen how some athletes, they forget their sponsors, they forget the most important aspects of their ecosystem. And let's create something that you can then have links to your social channels. You can showcase your key metrics. So it's your follower numbers and the mm. vanity stuff, but then also where in the world your fans are based um, and then as we kind of progressed the thinking, we then thought, well, what about the likes of being able to sell merchandise? Because now customizable merch, drop shipping, it's a reality. All you need to do is upload a logo. If you don't have a, a logo, we can design one for you. And then five minutes later, you have the ability to have a pop-up shop of hoodies, t-shirts, caps, etc. Yeah. Um, initially, we had a, a built-in charity resource. So you could raise funds for a charity because obviously Brian had his own charity. And over the last 12 months, we realized that, you know, most of these athletes, they are trying to put food on their own table. So it's not necessarily priority for them to be raising funds uh, as a philanthropic gesture. And by working with the SA hockey team, we pivoted the crowd, uh, the charity page to an actual crowdfunding page. And we used the crowdfunding as a mechanism to allow the hockey people to infiltrate their communities and their networks through their own social channels. Mm -hmm. And they drove their links to their social channels at generated PR. We got them onto the likes of carte blanche. They were featured on most of the major news outlets around the country. And that had a huge impact for the Cinderella sport because one, they were able to crowdfund cash. Two, it also put a little bit of pressure on the administrators who previously have blocked hockey from going, mm. saying, mm. oh, you have no chance. When in actual fact, if you read between the lines, so few individuals went to the Olympics because you had top brass fat cats who would rather fly first class and go and eat some sushi with caviar in, uh, in Tokyo. And mm. I think 
that for me was the proudest moment of the hockey experiment because ultimately the guys are now in, in Tokyo as we speak. And uh, by the time this flights, who knows what their fortunes may have been like. But I think that for me was great is like pairing the tech with that service. It's like software with the service thinking. And going back to your earlier comment, as, as individuals like you and I, like we love selling service because it's a, it's a great sell. You sell with your mouth, you get in front of the right decision makers, whereas product, product is a whole different uh, mm, ecosystem. Mm. So it sounds like, Mike, you saw two things. Number one, you saw that even, even in the case of many top sports personalities, there is a, um, an underappreciation for the value of owned digital properties and, and it's sort of a barrier, even though it's gotten easier to set up websites and so on, it's never easy. There's always some sort of barrier or some sort of technological uh, speed bump that you've got to get over. But the second thing is that it sounds like you also saw an opportunity in this kind of massive um, untapped market of, as you, as you have, have put it, sportsmen and women who aren't necessarily in the top like 0.5%. Because I guess there's a temptation as a fan to look at famous rugby players, famous golfers, famous footballers, and assume that all of them are earning Cristiano Ronaldo money. Um, and the truth is that there's a, a very thin layer on top that break through to that kind of wealth. And then there's a massive crowd of individuals who are, as you said, very good at what they do, but still need still need a job effectively, you know, uh, and still need to think about retirement and all of the things that you and I and other ordinary business people uh, have to consider from day to day. I want I want to rewind a little bit though, and 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 ask you about. You know, was was Matchkit a formed idea in your minds, or has it? Did it start as kind of one thing and then evolve as a, as a technology product quite rapidly, and then and then maybe after that, talk to us about the experiment around the hockey team because I don't know if all of the listeners will be a hundred percent aware of what you guys did there. So I think um, the maybe a starting point with all of those comments and questions. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I think. Ultimately, we, we had, for me, I'm a lowest common denominator kind of person. Like I'm a good is better than perfect, launch yeah. it, create the hype, get people interested, see what the experimentation is off the back of that, what's working, what isn't, iterate, refine, and then kind of use that feedback loop from your customers to grow. In this one, initially, um, the plan was to use 2020 as a bit of a bit of a drip strategy so slowly mm -hmm. go to market do an mvp you know and just see where see where the journey takes you um but then the the internal debate and arm wrestles were really around the fact would we do this for any client that we work with like would we would we drip anything and the mm. answer was resoundingly no like mm. for me i'm the make the hype get the press release going, get the conference going, get the networking going, slide into the DMs of the, of the relevant influencer for the idea and just snowball the thing. And the decision was then taken, let's launch. We, we stuck a, a stake in the ground of June 3rd uh, last year and we effectively went from domain registration to our MVP in three months. So we, we, there was a whole bunch of, there was a whole bunch of like sketching, um, we, we kind of looked at platforms, everything from the extremes of like, what makes Tinder so valuable? Tinder is, is valuable because here's a very striking picture, a funny bio, and then you're either into that individual, you've swiped left or you've swiped right. Um, yeah. Where's the one place athletes look the most professional? Instagram. They don't all have Facebook. They don't all have Twitter. But Instagram is the one place that athletes are on. So if we use uh, Instagram as our entry point, we know that the athletes will at least look incredibly attractive. They'll look their best. They'll look professional. And then the rest uh, of, of the, the ecosystem that lives below the fold on this profile, like that can be more around stats driven, yes. video highlights. And, and ultimately... The structure of the match kit today is very close to what the MVP was when, for me, I was like, let's be niche razor focused on profile. Then mm -hmm. the rest of the team basically said, we need to have some more features. You can't just go to market with such a basic product. I said, ah, oh, of course you can. But ultimately, <laughs> I think the decision to have 
built-in merch and the ability to crowdfund from day one and to have an Critical. inbox yeah. for commercial requests was like an important launch product. Mm. And then what we did was we had a virtual press conference because we were in hard lockdown, virtual press conference to South African sports media and sports influencers who were more media than blogger. And um, from there, we had a press conference hosted by myself and Brian, and we told people what we were launching. And the whole positioning around that was Match Kit's going to help athletes get back into the game. For the first time in human history, even if we go all the way back to Roman gladiator games, there's never been a time when an athlete has understood their mortality more than mm. during COVID-19 hard lockdown. The fact that you are healthy and fit and you have to be locked up at home, you can't even go to the training ground, that punched athletes in the face for the first time mm. to say, yeah. this thing's going to end at some stage and no one could have ever explained them, this to them. And I think the stats are clear. Sports Illustrated has done numerous stats around it. The NCAA with college athletes, ultimately the average NFL players bankrupt within three years of their career. The average NBA players bankrupt within five years. And I mean, I'd hate to look at the numbers when it comes to rugby and the more Commonwealth Games sports. But ultimately, what's the one thing that happens with athletes is that they want to live the same lifestyle that they had during their playing mm, days, mm, but they mm. don't have the cash and they don't have the resources to support that. And that's yeah. where so many of them fall from grace, unfortunately. And once again, using Brian as like a as a yardstick, he's been able to continue to conclude deals with some of the biggest brands on the planet, still be an ambassador for some of the biggest brands on the planet. And he's taking contracts away from existing players because he's built such a strong personal brand. And whenever yeah. we use, I mean, I don't like using these branding cliches, but Brian's a great North Star that a lot of individuals can associate with and can identify with. So mm. then on the global scale, then we went and used rugby as a hyper focus because the whole rugby world knows Brian. So instead sure. of just opening it up to a potential press conference to journalists from the New York Times or the LA Times or whatever it may be, let's go into key markets where rugby and Brian are still a thing. So Sydney, Asia Pac, South America, UAE, Europe. We had a host of uh, international journalists that we that we then invited to this virtual conference just for the internationals. And off the back of that, the amount of PR we gen generated was akin to what we would have generated for a client with a much larger budget, just mm. based on using the network and using um, the opportunities and the tactics that we would for a normal client. And I think that's, that was like an important thing is like, we're going to do this, do it with the strength and the superpowers that you have that you apply to other brands, even though it yeah, is a startup. Sure. And the, the hockey idea? So you, you mentioned us... Um, breaking into the alpha code project and i think that's an important next step on the on the story mm. because we managed to gain some traction we managed to do some deals with south american rugby that represents the five spanish speaking nations and obviously the sixth one is the the portuguese nation of brazil and we managed to do a deal with them that allowed us to have a bit more runway. It gave us about 12 months worth of runway with the cash flow that came off the back of that deal and the 150, 200 rugby players that we converted from South America. South America had always been seen as almost like the stepchild of world rugby, it received less grants compared to the larger nations. There was almost seen more as an amateur network as opposed to a professional network. Mm -hmm. And by plugging into, into those players, we were able to then use our tech to surface the bios of those players into an existing yeah. OTT streaming platform for South American rugby. And then okay. we could go back to the commercial arm of South American rugby and showcase that over their last tournament, which is it's similar to like a super rugby tournament between these various nations. Yeah. We could show that of all the athletes that were on uh, match kit during that process, they generated six million eyeballs worth of engagement from their fans that they have across their collective social channels. So now you've got 50,000 downloads of an OTT app, but you've got an audience of six million people that's engaging with rugby, one of the smallest sports um, supposedly in South America. And that then arms the commercial heads to be able to reach out to telcos, banks, international brands about the importance of why you should be sponsoring South American rugby. And I think that gave us insights into the importance that athletes are our focus, but mm -hmm. 
but teams are our business because mm. ultimately as a B2B play, you've got one client, hundreds of athletes. And if Mike doesn't make the rugby team next season, there'll be a replacement. So you're not losing a client through churn, but you're yes, rather replacing yes. him with a future player. And you're reliant on a B2B model for continuous monthly recurring revenue. And I suppose those properties see the opportunity in kind of an ecosystem of strong brands. Um, for them, it's, it's got to be good for whatever code you're talking about or whatever institutions behind that. You know, we know already that sports administration has got a lot uh, to learn about commercialization. And certainly, I think a lot of um, organizations in the United States are, are showing what's possible with the right commercial mindset. But th th that's not trickling down as quickly as we might have hoped into other um, regions and into other codes. But I think you, you've brought something that kind of is almost a turnkey solution in a way for a lot of those organizations and, and for administrators in sports. What's fascinating is that there's a whole new evolution in this in a college ecosystem of sports in the US that's currently taking place. Prior to this year, college athletes couldn't make money. They could hmm. earn a scholarship, yes. but they yes, would not be able that, to yeah. commercialize themselves as properties. But now yes. there's a new uh, act called NIL, which is name, image, and likeness. And now as a player, you can actually commercialize that through a third party. So the university can't pay you to play college football or college basketball, but your local brand can pay you to wear their logo or mm, be an influencer mm. through your social channels. And I think that there's, it's fascinating that it's taken so long for this sort of disruption to happen to something that you thought was quite an innovative and forward thinking space. But I think we are excited about the developments that are happening in that area. And, and that's why we've kind of invested in wanting to go onto accelerators and be part of these boot camps where people force you to think about your product or offering in a different way. Like for me, I think you and I have very similar backgrounds in the sense that we have this idea, we don't necessarily know how we're going to execute on it, but we try our damnedest and we make it work. And I think with this as a product, you need a little bit more planning and there needs to be more business plan thinking to an extent, financial yeah. forecasting, napkin financials, all that stuff that comes with almost like business school thinking. And uh, what we did was we applied for RMI's Alpha Code. RMI is Rand Merchant Investments. And it's been a critical component of South African business. If you think about the likes of Outurance, of Discovery, so many of these businesses were incubated or given their first leg up because of Rand Merchant Investments. Mm. And um, that's what the product does and the, the program does now. It's on the hunt for fintech products that can potentially change society based on the unique needs of South Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans and, and, and Africans at large. And I think that we, we had to go through quite a rigorous process. You have to submit a whole bunch of forms and answer questions and provide as much information around your idea or product as possible. For a lot of the other intakes into the cohort, they were just at the idea phase. They didn't necessarily have a product, but there were guys that were working on crypto offerings. There is a company called Bento who is building like mm. um, employee benefits or perks uh, that you own and you can move around with. There was a, a company that focused on how you can go to independent suppliers when you need to fix a dent in your car. Uh, and there's some individuals in the agricultural space. So it was really a mixed bag of different people and different stages of ideas. And um, for the first 12 weeks, we were involved in intensive workshop sessions, two times three hour sessions a week, obviously mm. all virtual during this period. But what was fantastic is every week, you're going through a theory and then the practical of what that means to bring that aspect of your business to life. And because it's modularized over the 12 week period, you get to a stage where you've effectively built um, a demo deck or an investor deck mm. in terms of mm. what your idea entails, what the forecasts are, what the financials look like and, and how you actually add value to the market all around that that value proposition, your business model canvas, all the all the good stuff that uh, comes with kind of management uh, thinking or consulting principles. And um, you're, us, a, you're a seasoned business person and a successful entrepreneur already. Uh, Mike, did you at any point in time early on in the journey go, maybe I don't need this, but it would be a nice to have? And were you, I mean, it sounds like you certainly were like bowled over by the experience, right? It was 
worth its weight in gold. Um, you know, how, do you think it's because this is a technology product? So you're thinking about the business in, in different ways? Or do you just think that perhaps um, some of the foundational theory was stuff that people like you and I have learned on the fly, but never really formalized in our minds? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like when we go back to, I mean, I've, I finished Varsity in 2004 and most of the stuff that my businesses have been built on have been built on gut experimentation and self-learning. And I think um, I've never really gone through a formal startup kind of headspace on like, where do you connect the dots and how do you build the bricks from the, the base up? And I think mm. what was good about this, it challenged the default of mine, which is usually gut. Like I trust the gut so implicitly that I think you can definitely get tripped up from a product perspective by trusting your gut too much. It can be expensive. Your school fees are a lot more aggressive if you make a sure. mistake on a product business sure. and you dev down the line and you realize that you actually have to unwire stuff. So for me, um, we actually had these debates with AlphaCode. They said, we're worried that potentially you've done this for too long, that you're more seasoned than some of the other entrepreneurs. And I said to them, listen, I'm more than happy to humble myself and treat this as absolutely new learnings. And the majority of the course was stuff that I had never been exposed to from the, the real theoretical side of things. And I think what was good is that as a team of founders, we all have such different personalities. Like mm. I'm more gut, then we've got an individual who's much more analytical, then we've got like an analytical gut kind of balance. And generally, the loudest person in the room can win an argument because they just are the most convincing or they're the mm. loudest. When it sure. comes to a program like AlphaCode, you're set up with these very micro sorts of deliverables in the sense that they have to be built on a hypothesis and then they have to be proven by an experiment. So it, there are moments that are incredibly frustrating because you believe something will work a certain way. But if you haven't hypothesized it and experimented, no one will ever know. And then once again, you could fall into the trap of uh, throwing money into a pit in terms of actual evolution or development of that product. And, and that's where, when we take a step back to SA Hockey, like my view was if we had a um, real life experiment that we could play with, we could prove that an unknown sport filled with what is not really any well-known mainstream heroes that mm -hmm. we could help them raise money. And um, I think in that instance, uh, it was definitely a mix of our strength from a PR perspective, coupled with the tech to be able to fundraise. But it also gave those individuals within the team something to get excited about it gave them something to band together Simple, about yeah. because so many of those hockey players are forced to play in german markets or dutch markets because of the fact that they can't earn a, a living playing hockey in south africa so most of our hockey players are internationals but then they gave a story and a narrative plus they had the tech that they could then send to their clubs in europe and a few thousand euros you know a lot of times it's, it's not as aggressive an ask as asking someone for 60, 70 grand. And I think that's where we've, we've had um, some great inroads using hockey as an experiment, which was born out of this um, alpha code experience. And um, yeah, I think the the lessons and the upside from going on an accelerator is, is really valuable like regardless of the, the life cycle that you've been in on an entrepreneurship journey. Um, I do think that, like most textbooks tell you, you get better with your ideas as you age and as you've had the credibility and you've had the wins and the losses. And I think that ultimately with any of these programs, what you take from them is what has the greatest impact on how you go forward with those thinkings and insights. So what have been the some of the, the main insights or lessons that you've taken out of the experience, whether it's from uh, instructors or, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that were guests on the program or, or even uh, people that were in your cohort with you? What, what are some of the things that you wish you could go back to Mike in 2004, graduating from university and say, like, if you're going to start a business now, the, these are some of the things that you must know. I think, um, you know, for me, it's a little bit divorced from the program, but I think for me, <laughs> You know, we, we both have a mutual friend, Melissa Atri, and and she mm. said to me back in the day, I mean, her her wisest 
phrase that I always have burnt into the back of my brain is just don't let the fears of financial failure cripple you. And I think it's such a profound quote because money does very terrible things to your creative problem solving side of your brain. It makes hmm. you desperate. It makes you appear like it's almost it's like a it's a desperation odor instead of a body odor. Like the, the fear of money like makes you stink and it makes hmm. people not want to work with you. And you see it with people and how they post on social people who post um, there's almost like this negativity to the fact that they didn't get the deal or they didn't get something that they wanted. It makes you not want to gravitate towards that person. And I think that's always the balance on social. And that's the reason why so many entrepreneurs don't put out the hardships and the realities of the lows, because ultimately people want to work with winners. And that goes back to athletes as well. You want to invest, you want to, you want to support a winning athlete. Mm -hmm. And regardless what they do or field, you want that winning to kind of come through in all aspects of that individual. So for me, that's a very important thing about money and understanding management accounts. I think that uh, for me, I, I, I would never have gone on a formal financial course or gone and done economics or anything like that. But what I have been um, really obsessed with since about 2015 was just really understanding the, the granular microcosm of my business, the margins, OPEX, you know, what do you depreciate? What are the aspects that you um, you actually plan for the future on, whether it be a bonus consideration, whether it be salary considerations, like there's, there's almost the real money and the cash flow side of things. But then there's also how you compartmentalize the cash into different cells on a spreadsheet. And I think that the, the earliest that I got into that, it actually helped my business grow and it helped the thinking now going forward. When it comes to product thinking, there's a lot more work to be done with napkin financials because you need to look at how do you grow your monthly recurring revenue. You and I will default as service guys to go out and we'll pitch a million rand campaign. And, you know, that's we, we back ourselves to win that. But when it comes to product, it's incremental growth and it's a few thousand rands every month. And that's mm. a completely mm. different mindset and it's a different shift to sell that versus selling million rand campaigns or million rand retainers. And, and I yeah. think like that's always such a fascinating psyche for me is how money permeates our thinking, both from mm. a business and personal perspective. And then the other thing that I would tell myself when I was 18 was just keep experimenting with stuff. I think when we look back in retrospect, you can always see, oh, this made sense and you can validate why that decision led to where you are now. But I think the reality is like when you're young and you have no bond and you have no kids and you have no pressures, it's a lot easier to take those risks. And I think, um, you know, you and I both, when we when we started our businesses, we were we were young and foolish and we we didn't have the fears that we have of today, right? And and when you get to this mature age, then you start independence. <laughs> then you start realizing that you actually you've got a little, little bit more safety. So now you can take that step up to more risks, but they're more calculated risks. Hmm. I love your point around financial literacy and I can obviously identify with it because we're similar in many ways in terms of our strengths and uh, <clears throat> weaknesses. Um, but, uh, and I mean, I land up, there's an irony to this in the sense that I'd land up talking to a lot of executives about how you don't have to be a coder to appreciate the value of engineers and software in your business, but you do need a level of technological literacy so that you can have meaningful conversations about the role of technology or digital, whatever it might be in your organization. You know, you don't have to have a Twitter account with 3000 followers to appreciate why Twitter might be important to your customers or to your staff. Same with finance for entrepreneurs. I think there is a level of financial literacy that is inexcusable if absent from your repertoire. And some of us aren't naturally attracted to that conversation or don't have a natural disposition towards uh, the accounting side of, I mean, certainly my results in matric reflected that. Um, but but a level of financial literacy, I think it's just, it's not something you can you can ignore. Uh, it, it, it's probably the most irresponsible decision you can make if you do deliberately uh, ignore that part of your business. Um, what other lessons did you garner from the, and, and you know, if there are entrepreneurs um, listening to, the show who potentially have the opportunity to engage in a program like that or approach an investor or explore incubation as an, uh, as an opportunity for growth, how would you help prime them for uh, that journey? 
the one thing that I have realized over the last 12 months is how much cash there is available in various ecosystems. Like even South Africa, we go through our challenges, but there are so many different programs, projects, and, mm. and they're all segmented. Sometimes it's women-based entrepreneurship. Sometimes it's black-based entrepreneurship. Sometimes it's youth entrepreneurship. But ultimately, there's almost a program for anybody. And I think yeah. if you really want something and you want to be able to go out there and launch a business or create an idea, it's a very difficult thing when you don't know what you don't know. And I think that I'm grateful that a lot of my experience was based on getting my hands dirty, being in the trenches, watching YouTube videos about how to run YouTube ads or, or whatever it may be. But I think that for me, I've always been a start something, generate the revenue, get the cash ticking over so that you give yourself a little bit more of freedom and flexibility in those financial fears. So that's kind of, that's always been my, my mindset. When I look at entrepreneurs that are pure idea based, the challenge of those ideas is that they always feel perfect in your head. And you can also vacillate between the planning and the preparation and all the stuff you need to get going that you end up having startup paralysis and you don't actually launch anything. And sure, I think sure. that's, the, that's the challenge when you've never launched something and it's just an idea phase. There's a lot of opportunities for you to go and pitch that idea and to get support. But if you've never run anything, I think that there's a huge gap of knowledge that you will never have until you've actually experienced it from running a startup or two. So I think that that for me is just like a personal distinction in terms of the way that I like to start stuff. And then I think with these programs, what is great is that you are paired with a mentor and you have the ability to have that person second guess every one of your decisions. So mm. you have your mentor mm. sessions. I like being with a business shrink. You, and it's, and it's, yeah. and it's the value different. of perspective. Yeah. And, and it's, it's different from coaching because those mentors generally have they're a CTO in, a, in an organization or they've got the finance experience. One of the best uh, guest mentors we've had is, uh, is a lady from R&B. She was there for like 15, 20 years, involved in a whole bunch of um, M&A activity and just she's like shoots straight from the hip in terms of telling you why your model is too conservative. It's, it's, it's not going to get you out of bed for it. And for me, like, I think that's, that's the evolution of financial thinking. It's like, you can understand your, your, your management accounts, you can understand all the, like, the various line items and what they mean. But ultimately, when it comes to like, scaling up or starting to build a bigger business, you have to start taking calculated risks in a way that isn't going to deplete all your cash flow, but it's also going to allow you to swing for the fences in a way that the upside doesn't sabotage the risk. And, and yeah. I think that for me, I've enjoyed the minds that we've had access to in this program also because mm, sure. everything is so customized. So they're happy to talk to me in a way that is different from someone who's just in an idea ideation phase. And they're also happy to, it, it's like, it's like grappling. They're happy to grapple with you based on your, on your strength of experience. And I think that for me has been the, the, the thing where like they, they, they call you on your BS when, um, when they feel that you are like shooting too low or you're being too conservative in your thinking. Now, come on, you guys are really good at this skill. Like this should be a no brainer for you. So you talk about like these wild and um, crazy kind of ideas, your big, hairy, audacious goals and all that kind of stuff. So like where did, where did the extreme sit and where does the safety sit and how far in between each of those extremes do you sit? Very cool. So because you're a creative genius, you found a way to ask, answer one of the questions I asked you to prepare for before I even asked it. But yeah, we're <laughs> going to ask a couple of questions at the end of uh, each of the episodes in the series. And, and the first one I asked was, if you could go back in time and give your 18-year-old self uh, <laughs> a, one sentence of advice, which obviously you managed to weave into an answer already, would you give something different or would it be about uh, you know uh, tempering yourself against financial fear? Yeah, you know, for me, I think that like I, I just kind of followed stuff that I was interested in and was passionate about. So like for me, um, I wanted to be an actor and I went to varsity as a safety, did my marketing degree. Um, I was fortunate to have an aunt and uncle who lived in the States. They were entrepreneurs themselves. And um, for me, I spent a lot of my, my summer holidays uh, with them. So in the middle of winter and my aunt used to go to these, um, she used to go to this convention every year called Safari Club in Reno. And it's the largest um, 
a mixture of everything from hunters to conservationists to uh, wildlife painters. And she used to sell railroad sleeper furniture there. That was her business. And for me, I got to sand tables and drive trucks, U-Haul trucks through the snow and put chains on and all of this crazy stuff. And, and, and from that, I went to acting school in Hollywood uh, after I finished my um, degree. And I just, every time there was something that I was kind of interested in, I just I gave it a go. And, and that's kind of what I used those first few years outside of school doing. And I mean, they were university of life thinkings, but based on ways that I could make money, everything from being a promoter and spraying fragrances on people outside of Edgar's to, you know, just, just following stuff that I felt I'd be interested in. And the lessons that I learned from writing a play and in my early twenties came with all of the aspects that fill a business on a daily basis, but you don't necessarily know that. So it was budget, it was production, it was promotion, it was marketing of your thing. So selling a play is very much like selling a, an athlete product. But at the time, didn't know that all these lessons were going to be valuable. And so many of those things became like part of my unconscious bias. And, and I apply those lessons today just because I was willing to give things Experiment a go. Then. Yeah. yeah. And I think cool. if you go back to the, the comment around Alpha Code, everything in that program was based on experimentation. And I think retrospectively, there's so much experimentation in my real life. And I think it, it also teaches you a lot about your strengths and weaknesses. You spoke about strengths and weaknesses earlier. And I think too few people ever want to face their weakness. There's too much blindsidedness from ego that we don't mm -hmm. we don't think about the negatives and these constrictions in our lives. Like we always want to hunt the glory. We want to keep up with the Joneses. We want to go for gold. But in, in so many occasions, there isn't even a medal. There's a, there's a lot of loss, right? And, and I think the way that you deal with those negatives earlier on paves the way for how you deal with conflict in the future self. Big time. Another question. Uh, if you could introduce, if you had the power to influence the schooling system and introduce one compulsory book that everybody should read while they are going through their educational journey, what book would you prescribe and why? <laughs> I'm going to give you a different answer here, Michael, because I think that we should, I think we should supply lonely planets to kids. And the reason why I say that is because if I could wave a magic wand and wake up as a minister of something or other tomorrow, <laughs> I would, I would look at replicating the model that a lot of Europeans and especially the Germans do is like, you get almost like a gap year that the government funds. And I know we've got yes. some other problems yes. that we end up not having enough cash anymore, but you know, if we could have a situation where you, in, instead of like your old conscription days where you go to the army, you have to spend six months with another family. Think about sticking an Afrikaans kid from Middleburg into uh, the Eastern Cape and he has to go live with the Klosser family for six months. Like, how incredible would that be? I mean, like, mm. the biggest problem around individual kind of tribalism and secularism is the fact that we are afraid of other people. Now, if you welcome other people into your life and you see that other people are living the same kind of struggles, they're going through the same kind of ups and downs as you, but just in different levels of that. If you think about sending kids into Mozambique or Namibia or any of the neighboring countries, like you learn so much stuff from travel. You learn so much stuff by being the minority. And so few of us have ever been the minority because we stick to our own safety and what we know. And for me, some of the best lessons in my life have come from traveling and, and travel is a hugely privileged kind of gift. And I think that so few people get to experience that gift and meeting strangers and having to force yourself to create small talk as the minority that mm. it adds so much value to our culture, our community, people understanding the importance of empathy and an openness and then understanding and listening because we don't, we just don't listen to each other. Mike, I think a, thank you again for the wisdom and the experience. I, if nothing else, the last couple of weeks have reminded me of just how critical support for uh, amplification of uh, small businesses are to not just us getting out of some of the challenges we have today, but to our immediate future as a country. And it's just really encouraging to see you experiencing some of that support and that there are ecosystems, as you said, that there is 
there are mechanisms in place. Sometimes you've got to do a little bit of searching and a little bit of moving and shaking to get to be a part of them. But there are such great ideas and such uniquely creative ideas coming out of our context. And just really encourage you to hear that you've had such a great experience as part of that. And it wasn't just kind of window dressing. It was a really, really valuable and enlightening process. And yeah, we, I mean, I think I speak for all of us when I say we can't wait to see what happens with Match Kit and where it goes to and how it changes the lives of athletes around the world. It's just, you know, thank you for your efforts and for your hard work. And we really wish you the best of luck for the future. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a, it's been a great chat. It's probably it's been an hour already. Oh, so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, my brother. We'll chat to you soon. Thanks, bro.